Happy Friday! It is time for a joyous episode of Locked on Magic. We're going to recount and rank the top five games of the 2023 season. Isn't that going to be fun? We're going to do it right now on Locked on Magic. You are Locked on Magic, your daily Orlando magic podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And you are indeed locked on magic. Today is May 5th, 2023. Revenge of the 5th. There's always a bigger 5th, whichever one you prefer. My name is Phil Prosperenreich. I'm the site expert and editor over at OrlandoMagicDaily.com. Of course, follow me on Twitter at R underscore OMD. On today's episode of Locked On Magic, we're going to continue our ranking of the top 10 games of the Orlando Magic's 2023 season. You can listen to part one of this episode uh, on yesterday's show. We'll get to the top five today. We'll get to all that coming up here in just a moment. But first, we want to thank you again for making Lockdown Magic part of your day every day, no matter when you listen to us, whether it's first thing in the morning, whether it's right when we upload. We truly appreciate you making Lockdown Magic part of your day every day. Remember, there's a great Lockdown podcast covering every single team in the NBA. Just search for Lockdown and the team you're looking for, the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. So... I like to do these exercises, and, and we've obviously had some time from the end of the season to, de- to decompress. We're still kind of recapping and looking back at the season. We're also trying to look ahead a little bit, especially with individual players, where they need to get better and, and what the Magic need to do. We've got plenty of off-season stuff. We'll do our, our normal draft segment at the end of the show as well. Um, you know, we're we're looking at this, this, this moment uh, to, to really kind of celebrate some big wins, but also ask, why do these wins resonate? Why are these wins important, especially the wins in this top five? Why do they matter? Why do they still mean something to a team that in in many ways, and with many of these wins, has grown so much? And, and, you know, you've probably heard me say this on uh, on this podcast several times. You know, to me, the NBA is not about the destination. Only one team wins the championship, and, and very few teams have that as a realistic goal. Um, it is truly about the journey. It is about enjoying the ups and downs. It's about finding meaning and and you know hoping that the good outweighs the bad at the end of the day. And and and, and it's about going through that journey. It's one of the reasons why I I love focusing on games because the journey is fun. The journey is what makes the story. Uh, and, and it's not about the destination. The destination is what it is. Um, you know, this is the great perspective that Giannis Antetokounmpo gave on his entire career after the Bucks lost. Is like, you know, it's a very positive outlook to say a, a crushing defeat like the one the Bucks suffered to the Heat is really just a step in his journey and a step in his path. And you know, the story. It, it obviously there. I think this Bucks season is a failure. Don't get me wrong. You know, all, all that, but. I think it is really healthy and positive to say, like, look, my story isn't fully written. This is just a chapter of it. And and honestly, it's really empowering, I think, that Giannis would say, it's in my power to make this chapter meaningful. It's only a failure if I let this chapter define me. But if I use it as fuel to get better, to come back better next year, to win a championship, then that becomes part of the story. That becomes part of the narrative and a positive part of the narrative. Even Michael Jordan had to go through the Pistons, got, didn't make his high school basketball team. All these are part of the myth of, of these, these players and these characters. And, and so it, with that in mind, I think it is important to kind of go back and look at some of these games and, and, and try and figure out why they're important. And so let's start with game number five on our list. It was one that came very early in the season, but one that foretold and, 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 and honestly very openly foretold what the Magic were going to become. It was November 3rd against the Golden State Warriors. The Magic have one of the weirdest win streaks in the entire league. The Golden State Warriors have not won in Orlando since 2018. They have not won, or won at, I guess they didn't play in the bubble, so they haven't won in Orlando since 2018. Um, this is a team 
that has championships, that has dominated this league for the last decade. And for the last five years, they haven't been able to win at the Amway Center. Um, and this game followed some of the very similar you know, highs and lows of those previous games. Shumo Keke had, a, had his best game of the season uh, or in this early season game against the Warriors. Um, hit a couple of big shots. But this game belonged to Jalen Suggs. Um, we talked about his game winner against the Bulls in our last episode. This game was probably Jalen Suggs' best game. Um, you know, at, at least the, the game that like made everyone like calm down a little bit about him. He had two big three pointers at the end of the game that helped the Magic win it, one thirty to one twenty nine, as well as two humongous steals from Stephen Curry. And obviously, that's huge. And with the Magic still in the midst of that early season struggle that they had, where they were, they started the year five and twenty, this was win three, I believe, of the season, uh, win two or three of the season. Um, this was a huge win, and it felt big. Um, because, you know, I'm a big believer that, especially for young teams, getting marquee wins on your home floor, that's how you build a fan base. And and the fans that sold out the MY Center, obviously, for the Warriors, the defending champions. But you could start feeling that, oh, fans are going to be bought into this team. It's not just curiosity about Paolo Bancaro and the number one pick. Fans really believe this group is going to do something. And to me, what stood out not only was the performance by Jalen Suggs and, and the gravity of the win, but Draymond Green said after the game, acknowledged the the weird streak that his team couldn't beat the Magic of all teams um, uh, at the Amway Center on the road. But he said, you know, I, we've been beaten by these guys a few times here, but this felt different. You know, the way the fans interacted felt different. This team feels different. And 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 he credited Paolo Bancaro, you know, a guy that was on his podcast during the offseason. So they, they have a little bit of a relationship he credited Paolo Bancaro for really kind of lifting the ceiling for this team. And, you know, in a time when the Magic were still struggling to find their way, were still struggling with injuries, they didn't have a point guard yet. Um, you know, they had Jalen Suggs back for this game, which helped. But at a time when the Magic were really struggling, this was a huge stamp of approval and a huge confidence boost for a young team. And obviously, that would it would take a while for the Magic to get themselves going. But they would find it eventually. And again, just a, a really big win that, that does fly under the radar. Number four on our list. January 23rd, Jonathan Isaac makes his long-awaited return. A 113-98 win over the Boston Celtics. We'll say plenty more about the Boston Celtics here in a bit. Um, but this game was all about J.I. And, and it was obviously a game that was three years in the making. A game that... Everyone's been waiting. Was waiting on uh, uh, the number one question that I got for two and a half seasons was when's Ji coming back? And I I just throw my hands up and say I don't know. They don't tell us anything, and and it's it's just not clear. And it just got to a point where he was out so long that caution overtook everything, and it frustrated a lot of fans. Um, you know, I'm sure it frustrated Jonathan Isaac as much as it, as anyone. It was just like, what are all these checks that he have to go through to get on the floor? So. When he finally got on the floor against the Celtics on, on this Monday evening, it was, no one knew what to expect. It was just, we're happy to have you out there for 10 minutes. Just go out there, play hard. Stats don't matter. So the fact that he scored eight points, the fact that he was a terror on the glass, the fact that he stole the ball from, J, from Jalen Brown, looked every bit the defensive menace that he was. It was just like, oh, this guy can still play. And obviously, Isaac only played 11 games. We're going to do our, our play evaluation on him next week. Played only 11 games and left a lot of questions because of, of, of an abductor injury that uh, required surgery. He should be good to go for training camp. But it's still been now three, four years. You know, he, he was injured originally January 1st, 2020. So it's been three years. It'll be three and a half years since Isaac has played full time without really any interruption. But... None of that mattered because for a team, for a group that was so tight-knit, um, that, that was so together, they were just happy to celebrate their teammate reaching this milestone and to do it in a win, to see Isaac play so well and, and continue to play well after this. It, it was enough. It was, just, it was just enough. And it was just a day that everyone celebrated, all of Isaac's skeptics, all of Isaac's supporters, all Magic fandom, honestly just celebrated this moment. And it just reminded us what a special and hardworking kid that Jonathan Isaac is. It reminded us how good Isaac can be and just how 
depth, how deep this team's talent was when they were healthy. Never mind, it was a humongous win over the Celtics and just a huge confidence boost and a shot in the arm and, and, and all of that. Isaac really did lift this team up in a pretty significant way. We'll chat about the top three games of the Orlando Magic season. I'm sure you can guess what two of them are. I'm probably going to talk more about the top two than, than number three, although number three's, number th- what I picked for number three is pretty good too. We'll, we'll get to all that coming up here in just a moment. But first, it's time for a quick word from our friends at eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. Sorry, my copy's just messing up. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. When you shop on eBay Motors and with more than 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. So let's get to it. Home stretch here. Top three games of the Orlando Magic season. And yeah, I cheat a little bit. I paired a few games together because they, they hit the same theme and... Uh, there were just, honestly, like, there were a lot of fun games to choose from. You know, for, for the first time in a while, uh, Kobe called me out on this. Uh, I only had one loss on last year's list, but I, I do remember looking at multiple losses for top 10 games. This year, there was only one loss I really considered uh, as a top 10 game in Magic history. So, you know, we're at a point where, where wins are good. We're, we're, we're not counting moral, moral defeats, but uh, moral victories. Um, but, but... Uh, Number three on our list is is really about the defining story of the season. Uh, the num- number three game on our list is, is a pair of games, one at the beginning of the season, one toward the end, that really, I think, encapsulates the journey that we went through. And that is the best of Paolo Bancaro. Starting with opening night against the Detroit Pistons, a one thir- uh, what was it, a 113-109 loss. Let me pull up my, my scoreboard here. Uh, 113-109 loss. And then a February 27th game at the New Orleans Pelicans, a 101-93 to win. Obviously, there were great moments for Paolo Bancaro in between. But to me, these two games were the two best games that Paolo played and the two games that stood out and showed his growth through the course of the season. Obviously, opening night, none of us knew what to expect from Paolo Bancaro. We knew he'd be good. We knew it might take some time because he's a rookie. But to come out and score 27 points, and honestly, the Magic didn't run a lot of plays for him. He just kind of scrapped for offensive rebounds, got out in transition, obviously had the big dunk. It was it was just an impressive performance, and it was just like, oh, Paolo's going to be able to score pretty easily. And, and yes, the Pistons weren't the best defensive team, but Paolo more than held his own, and we were we all believed that point. Um, you know, a lot of when we asked on on open on on during Paolo Bancaro's Rookie of the Year ceremony. A lot of us asked, when did you know Paolo Bancaro was going to be Rookie of the Year? And like David Seals said, you know, you kind of knew from the first game of the year that this kid was going to be really special, that this kid could hold his own, that he would set the bar so incredibly high for what rookies could do. And obviously he did. He won 98 of 100 first place votes, um, despite people trying to uh, make arguments to the contrary as he just played so well and so consistently without really like having any major spikes. But honestly, like, the first game is a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, but to me, the biggest moment of growth for Paolo came uh, against the New Orleans Pelicans in February. Um, this was a game the Magic were in a tight battle. Uh, it, was, it was back and forth. You know, a, a more veteran team in, in the Pelicans. The Magic, uh, Paolo's obviously had his struggles late in games. And he came out and hit three humongous shots as well as made an assist down the stretch that guaranteed the Magic a win, that gave the Magic the victory. And and to me, the poise and calm that he played with, the shot-making that he played with, that's what stars do. And, you know, I've talked a lot about it on this show. The Magic often made decisions for development over winning. And and that was fine. And one of those decisions was, Paolo Bancaro's going to get the ball late in games. 
he was awful late in games. In clutch situations, he was bad. He was not an efficient shooter. He made a lot of mistakes. And so this was a game that just kind of, the light bulb clicked and he made the plays and it was just like, okay, he's going to get it. And that's why this game stands out. It was a pretty nondescript game in the middle of February, but to me, it was emblematic of how much Paolo had grown and what he's ultimately going to do as a as a star in this league. And, and I don't I don't think that's going to go away. So just a really, really impressive game. Uh, his final stats almost don't matter. I think he still had like 26, 26 or 27 in that game. Um, this made this, these humongous shots in that one. Kind of similarly, our, our number two game, I'm, I'm sure you can guess what I think is the number two game. And to me, it was a game that showed how much this team had grown as well. Uh, you know, if, if, if the Pelicans game was about how much Paolo had grown individually, our, our number two game is about how much the team had grown as a group. Back in February, February 11th, actually, the Orlando Magic had, I think, was a 17-point lead over the Miami Heat. They let the Heat back into the game, let them force overtime, and then they just wilted in overtime. You know, they, they, they looked like the Milwaukee Bucks did in the playoff series. The, 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 the Heat did this to everybody. They don't stop. They don't quit. Their goal is to make it a close game, and then Jimmy Butler is going to bring them home. That's that's that that's the Heat's whole season. Uh, and look, it works. It works for them. They delivered. They got into close games. They won a lot of close games. Uh, and so, the Magic lost this crushing game, and it felt huge because Saturday night against your rival, your in-state rival, jam-packed, sold-out Amway Center. Your young team trying to establish yourself. It was a bad loss for all those reasons. A month later, the Miami Heat came back into the Amway Center. March 11th, the Heat are back in the Amway Center. Amway Center, And the same thing happens. The Magic take a big lead. They play a great first half. They give that lead up in, in the second half. Jimmy Butler hits a three with, what, four-tenths of a second left or at the bu- you know near the buzzer to complete the comeback and force overtime. And the Magic found themselves in the same situation again. The Magic found themselves staring down. We've got to get momentum back. We've got to find a way to find the energy after giving up this huge run to go get this win. And this time, instead of wilting, they dominated. Yes, you don't like blowing 17-point leads and and at home against a rival and and all that. Uh, Yes, 100%. Agree with that. But the Magic... Said, I think what O'Carter said in the locker room and in the huddle, said, you know, said after the game, we determined we were not going to lose this game. We were not going to let this happen again. And to show, see the growth in against the same team, similar situation, from one month to the next, that's a huge deal. That's a huge victory. That is a big, big deal. Forget the opponent. The opponent's important in this story too, but forget that for a second. For a young team to face the same situation. Make some of the same mistakes, but still come out on top and learn something from it. That told us this Magic team had figured some things out. That they had gotten better. And and it was a a humongous game and and a humongous win for the team. Honestly, like, probably my favorite win of the season was against the Heat back in March. Um, You know, again, reason why I have it ranked number two. But our number one win of the season was perhaps a moment when we all started to really believe in this team. When we were like, okay, this 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 isn't something that's a flash in the pan. That, that This starts to feel a little bit real. And it was two games again. A weekend in Boston, December 16th and December 18th. A 117-109 win over the Celtics and then a 95-92 win over the Celtics on a Sunday afternoon. This was the... Def- Honestly, this game made the season. Um, you know, it was the end of the six-game win streak. For the game win win five and six on the win streak. Games that the Magic really had no business being in because the Celtics were by far and away the best team in the in the East at that point. Probably the best team in the league at that point. They were playing really, really well. The Magic matched up well with them in the in a, in, a, in this early season battle back in Orlando. But to go on the road, take two from the Celtics, and, and frankly dominate the games, and, and especially that second game to do it with defense. Um, when, you know, especially with Wendell, I think Wendell Carter was out at this point still, or you know, Mo Wagner had big ga- had a big game in this moment. Um, Paolo had big had big games. Everyone contributed something 
to help the Magic win this game, win these games. And obviously, it sent Boston into hysterics. You know, Eddie House had a point, I guess, because you know they're they're still struggling with some of those issues they struggled with when the Magic beat them twice. But to me, and I think to all of us, this was the statement that the Magic had something. It hadn't quite coalesced yet. Um, it was, you know, still picking up steam. Uh, obviously, that win streak was a huge moment in the season, saved the season in, in a lot of ways. Um, the Magic were still picking up steam and, and still figuring out who they were and who they are. But this was a crystal clear moment that, hey, we can compete with the best teams in the league. We can beat the best teams in the league. We have the talent. We have the ability. We just need the belief. And this was belief. And for the rest of the season, honestly, from the time that win streak ended, I think the Magic... The Magic lost to the Hawks, and I think they won two more. But from the time the win streak ended, um, a Monday night game against Atlanta on a back-to-back uh, that they almost won, um, till for the next two months, the Magic did not lose more than two games in a row the rest uh, until until March, I think. Um, this established the Magic and certainly gave the Magic the confidence that, hey, we are a playoff-capable team. It isn't just talk. We have the ability. We can see we have the ability. And this early season game... Part of that win streak was confidence that the Magic had for the rest of the year. Again, process over results is great. You need confirmation of belief too. You need you need confirmation of faith as well. And this Magic team was bought in from the very beginning of the season. They stayed bought in through a 5-20 and start. And they went on this win streak. They got these two wins especially. And it was just like, oh, we can actually do this. This 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 All this stuff that, that we're talking about, it works. Let's stick to it. Let's grow it. Let's build it. And let's do it. And and that's what the Magic did all season. And, and you know, while these two games were the end of that six-game win streak and, and certainly a high that the Magic never quite reached the rest of the year as they, you know, played 500 the rest of the way, uh, it was also a statement of of intent and, and, and a declaration of intent as well of, of who this team can be. Those are our top 10 games of the Orlando Magic season. Let's chat about the playoffs, some of the news around the NBA, plus our daily lottery spin coming up here in just a moment. Just one game of NBA action uh, on Thursday as the Golden State Warriors dominate the Los Angeles Lakers. You know, obviously it sucks having only one game and it being a complete blowout, but you know, it, it is really revealing of what's been important in this in this postseason. Despite all the 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 love for three point shooting and despite everything about three point shooting that goes on, this postseason is still about the paint. Win the paint, you win everything. That it, it's it's frankly that simple. Um, and and you know you look at the Lakers, they dominated the paint, they got to the foul line in game one. Golden State still had a chance to win, but. But they, the Anthony Davis really dominated the paint. Golden State made some key adjustments. They did a much better job attacking the paint. They didn't foul, and the Lakers found themselves really, really struggling uh, to hold on and, and to stay in the game. Golden State hit a lot of shots. That happens against Golden State. We're going back to Los Angeles. One. We're going over to Los Angeles one one. So not a lot to say there. But you, you look at all these series, and, and again, the reason why I like talking about the playoffs is because it teaches us something about what the Magic are going to have to do when they get to the playoffs. The paint still matters. Mitchell Robinson destroyed the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Heat destroyed the Bucks in the paint. You know, Bam Adebayo didn't have the greatest series, but you know he still dominated that that paint. Uh, Denver and certainly not having Giannis helps. Um, Nikola Jokic is destroying Phoenix in the paint. Phoenix has no answer in the paint right now. Uh, Golden State. Kevon Looney's been the star of the playoffs because he ate up the Monta Sabonis. Uh, it, I, I think there's a stat that. The leading rebounder in the league hasn't been out rebounded by as much as Kevin, Kevon Looney out rebounded Demonte Sabonis since like Dennis Rodman did it to uh, I forget who, but it was like in the '90s. Like it's it's been that long, and so um, the paint the paint still matters. And look, the Lakers are going to go as Anthony Davis goes. If Anthony Davis has a good game, then then the uh, Lakers will have a good game. Um, I'm having some computer issues, so I apologize. That's one of the reasons why I'm coming out so late today, uh, but. Uh, on top of all this, we have uh, the big news that came out of Milwaukee that the Bucks have fired Mike Gunholzer. And as always happens when a good coach comes on the on the market, someone pinged me and said, "Like, hey, should the Magic go after Mike Gunholzer?" And uh, I'm just like, "No, guys, no, not no, no." 
Jamal Mosley's done a really good job. He's got the trust and belief of this team. I'm not here to deny that Boonholzer wouldn't help. Um, you know, I think that if, like, the Magic struggle or flatline a little bit, Mike is the exact coach that would help this Magic team. But at this juncture, you want stability. Um, you want consistency of message. You know, this team is still on the climb. They haven't plateaued. The reason you fire a coach is because you plateaued or, or, you, or you're, just, you're going in the wrong direction. So, like... The Raptors fired Nick Nurse because they've plateaued. The, the vo- they need a new voice in the locker room. They need to change something to make that group work. You know, Budenholzer got fired because the team failed to meet expectations. And, and there's certainly a lot of hints and a lot of talk about why that happened. Um, it that's, that's part of the equation here. That's part of what's going on. And so I think that... I think that, you know, Bud's a great coach. He's going to land on the street somewhere. He's going to end up somewhere very, very good because he's been successful in Atlanta. He's been successful in Milwaukee. Um, but Orlando's not the right situation for him uh, quite yet, or, or certainly you know, the Magic should be should be very happy with the coach they have because uh, Jamal Mosley's done a really good job. So let's cut that out. Let's do our daily lottery spin real quick uh, because I, I'm trying to get out quick before my computer decides to yell at me once again. Um, our lot- lottery spin today, Houston gets the first pick, San Antonio second, Charlotte third, Orlando fourth. That leaves Orlando with the fourth and 11th pick. Um, we've talked a little bit about what happens if Orlando gets to four. Um, I do think that the Magic should look at Amen, Asar, uh, Amen and Asar Thompson and Cam Whitmore. Um, you know, I am still a big believer that you draft talent. Uh, so, you know, unless there is, you don't trade, to, you don't trade a pick just to trade a pick. Talent is talent. Take talent. Um, and so... Amen Thompson is very talented. Asar Thompson is very talented. Cam Whitmore is very talented. They could all help this Magic team. If there isn't a deal out there, you take one of those three guys and you don't think about it. Um, you know, I, I I am a little shocked in our community mock draft right now. Cam Whitmore is still on the board. Um, that is very surprising to me. Uh, but uh, but you know, he's a guy. That there are a lot of questions about. And look, everyone in this draft has a big question about them. I, I don't think this is a very star laden draft. Outside of Victor, outside of Scoot, um, outside of Brandon Miller and Alice and the Thompson twins and Whitmore, those are probably your 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 possible stars, but they could also be possible busts because there are there are severe weaknesses in their games that could prevent them from reaching their full potential. And and again, situations gotta be right, teams gotta be right, they gotta be right. Um, and that's half of what you're guessing uh, in, in this scenario and in this situation. Our community mock draft is going to continue over the weekend on at Omagic Deal. I'm hoping to have that done uh, early next week. We'll talk about a little bit of the results in, in our draft segment uh, coming up here uh, over the next couple of weeks. But that's going to do it for me today. I want to thank you all again for listening to today's episode of Locked on Magic. Of course, find me on Twitter at Philip R underscore OMD. Subscribe to the podcast and Apple Podcasts. Hit your tune in Himalaya, Google Play, Spotify, Odyssey, and all the fun by download podcasts to your podcast enabled listening device. For the latest on the Orlando Magic, be sure to check out orlandomagicdaily.com. Of course, find us on Twitter there at omagicdaily. We want to thank you again for making Locked on Magic part of your day every day. For our everyday listeners, be sure to tune in Monday. We're going to jump back in to our... Um, player evaluations. We'll talk a little bit about Jonathan Isaac's season, plus a whole lot more. We'll get to all that on Monday's episode of Lockdown Magic. But until then, for Orlando Magic Daily and Lockdown Magic, this has been Philip Rossman-Reich. We'll see you all again next time for another episode of Lockdown Magic.